the first job I want to do today. And it's probably not going to, I'm going to do this in pieces, is wet sand out this wing. The reason is I want to know, it doesn't have all the clear on it, but I want to know. Now, there's a couple of things. There's never going to be any wood grain on this, so that's number one. But I don't know if we're going to have what I'll call Nomex grain. You can see down here where some glue has gotten down in there. Maybe I won't be able to sand that out. I'm not sure. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to work on this. This tip has some Nomex grain. I don't know that looks kind of cool. It looks kind of aerospacey looking and everything. But again, I don't know. I want to, and I'll do this all, well, most of it off camera, because I just want to pretty much see how this is going to pan out. And if I have enough clear on here, of course, I'm going to get one more copy on it. The weight was very competitive here, so I'm, I'm happy with that part of it. The, the only part I don't know is, at this point in time, are we going to be, you know, be able to get this plane and the B-25 done, or just this plane, or the B-25, but we're certainly going to give it the All-American try. Like, there's a couple of little things that really help me out. I never try to do it all in one session. And in fact, tonight I only have maybe an hour. I'm not sure how much time. Karen is out shopping, but again, I try to pick little spots of time that I can get a little bit ahead on this. And I want to sand one little spot out. This paint's been drying for a while. And the problem is we're still waiting for the control horns to get here. And they should be here very soon. Let's hope. Unless uh, Warren Walker had another date with President Bush, I don't know. But I wanted to show this up close. I wanted to give some indication. Now this is like a foam wing. And it was nice to hear that you know, like Bruce Hunt, for instance, is is just building a foam wing, and he just got the new the new video, so he was real happy with that. Yeah, there's kind of updated information on there, maybe something he can use right away. I always do one little spot like this, and the reason is, I'm just picking a spot at random on the bottom. I want to see if the paint is going to do what I want it to do, and what by that I mean go dull flat relatively easily. I think it's pretty easy to figure out. That's that's about as easy as it gets. Now, because I'm fussy and I'm going to do all the corners and edges, and I'll do most of this off camera. Now it looks like I can see the Nomex grain through there, but again, that's how we're, the only way you're going to find this out is by doing it. I want to really spend a little bit of time on each panel. I don't want to go rushing through it like as if the Nats is next week and I have to have it done. Just by taking my time, detailing out maybe one panel per night. I think I'll get the most effective or realistic look at, is this going to be a way, like next year when we build our plane, are we going to do it with a mold, are we going to do it with a foam, are we going to do it with ribs, are we going to do it with one of Bobby Hunt's Geo wings, or, or maybe something even better will come along. But being able to finish this without open bays, now if we had open bays, you know what we'd be doing with one little, be forever. When you can just do a big spot like this at once, it, it knocks the time to a fraction. As we put the rest of the clear on, you can see the, I call it the Nomex pattern or whatever you want to call it. But again, we'll see that this, this right here probably, you, you can absolutely cannot feel where the numbers are. So this may only need one more coat of clear. That of course would be very nice. But always on a big, on a big sand out, never try to do it all at once. Break it down over a couple of days and do it. That's the easiest way I know of. about the third little session I'm putting in on this and I thought I'd just mention one little thing that I found real helpful in a case like this I've already got the whole bottom done and I can get some feel for how quickly I'm going through I've gone through in a dozen or so little spots which I will all touch up but a good barometer of when you're ready for the last coat of clear and this is my barometer is I'll take a spot where there's tape in this case it's a letter and just sand the one letter or one edge. And if I can sand the edge, and this, this kind of takes a little bit of practice, but it works every time. Now, because this is not an open bay plane, this is not a real representation of how much time you'd put into this. More like a foam wing where you can really go at it. But anyway, when I get this done, even with rubber gloves on, the test is, 
can you feel the tape? In this case, I can't. It's perfectly smooth. And if I've gone through, then I know I need more, of which I already have. I know I need a little more clear on a wing, maybe one extra coat. But if, if right now I could still feel that little edge, well, before I do a whole lot more sanding and I'm going through, put more clear on. So, I don't know if I'm being clear about this, but there's really no way I know of to ensure that you have just that minimal amount of clear, that you've sealed the letters, sealed the ink lines, gotten all... What is he singing for? Shush! What is this, the mating season or something? And you don't want to get so much... You wouldn't want to have it that you've already sealed the letters and have 10 extra coats. You just That's just going along for the ride. So my feeling is once you can't feel the letters, then you're pretty much ready for that, what will be our last coat of clear, and we'll hopefully be able to put this aside to dry for a good month or so. And the thing that's significant here is that I don't have to deal with any open bays, but just as an example, I can go right up. I do try to do one letter at a time. A circular motion sometimes works real well around letters because all the angles, like Songbird over there, just won't shut up today. Hey, background music, quiet. I'm gonna send you to live with Ron Merrill. Find out about central air conditioning quick. Anyway, that's that's good information, and it took me a long time to figure out how do you figure how much clear. You can't do it by saying, oh, I'll just put a, coat of cl a quart of clear on. Because different guns atomize differently, different people sand different amounts off. But this way always works. If you can't feel the letters, you probably, and you haven't gone through, you probably, you know, one coat on top of that, one wet coat, and you're ready. And I'm not sure that'll work for everybody, but I think that's a good place to start. There's a couple little sand throughs on the corners, on the edges here. A spot where we had a little defective spot up there that I just back it off. Some of the edges. And by the way, I want to thank Bruce Hunt who sent me this video. I haven't even reviewed the whole video yet. I've been watching parts of it every day. From with several things on it, and there's supposed to be a B25 on this. This is one of the museums out by him. And Bruce, of course, is always sending us. He sends us a lot more stuff than we send him, so we gotta keep him on the payroll. Anyway, a couple of spots on the leading edge. But what this is telling me is that I haven't put too much clear on here. So the next step is get out my little Real Nemore airbrush. Make sure the paint is shaking up real well. As we just did the other little spots. It is Dorothy from G&D Hobbies. Just had her, called me up and <laughs> bought that spare wing that goes on the, uh, the B-25. So I guess her husband's going to think about building it. And boy, I look forward to helping him on that project. Last year we had Walt Brownell build kind of a similar type wing, and that was exciting. Anyway, the airbrush is the ticket to getting all these little spots taken care of. the realistic way to do little touch-ups like this. This Will Nomura airbrush is just so nice. See right over here you don't even have any paint. It's it's just so nice for this kind of a touch-up. The only thing I would not want to do with an airbrush is if I was going to put tape over this because like, you don't get a really the bond that I like when you use an airbrush. And it looks like we'll have a day to shoot some clear. We're trying to work. The reason I'm doing this instead of working on a B-25 today is because we're in this window of opportunity weather-wise. It's a very rare thing to have this quality of weather. And I just hope I'm right. I hope it doesn't fog up on me or change. Always extra around the edges anyway. And what I did is I did a little test on these parts, some small parts, it still need a little more clear because of the spots I touched up on them. 
I wanted to let this sit for a half hour. If this sits, and it's, it's bright and sunny out here, but I don't know about the humidity. But if this dries up without any sign of fogginess at all, we'll go ahead and paint the wing. And if we don't, we'll add 10% retarder, but we have to mix up some more clear anyway. But I don't want to put more than 10% retarder in. But this is a pretty good way of checking. Before I paint the wing, I wouldn't want to have the whole wing fog up. If this part fogs up, it's not the end of the world. It's a good little thing to have a little part like this. We are really fortunate in having this day. This is the most amazing. This never happens. The most important thing I want to get is all of these little touch-up spots. Get a little bit of extra on that. One thing I've found about the Brodak dope is it blends in. The color consistency is good. From can to can, you don't get a big variation in color. Again, because I want to get these edges. And this is always well. You can see what spots we've sanded through. Outer wing tip, it won't matter if you put 100 coats of extra dope out here. This isn't going to hurt anything. But I always do that half hour test before I paint. Another thing you know, you're never going to wear out the leading edge. Always a little bit extra on the trailing edge. I think I've gone over this on one of my little storyboards. Then I can look at the letters and see if there are any low spots. In this case, there aren't. I can just start filling in the blank. It's so unusual to have weather like this, and I really wish I was working on the B25, but right now I need to take advantage of this weather because come springtime, I want this paint to already be a month or two old. And this is like mid-January. I want it to be March, April before we actually start buffing and sanding and whatever. There's so many other projects to work on here that every time I use Brodak Dope, I just think, wow, I'm so glad that this worked out. Now, I know Bob Brookins would be saying, well, that isn't one coat, that's two. No, it's not, because I want to get the whole wing panel wet. This is not like a wood wing where you have to paint one wing and then run over and turn the other wing. This one, and of course, here comes the wind. It's amazing. And I want to get plenty extra where I need extra. And be a little skimpy in the parts I need to be skimpy on. So what I'll probably do is let half of this dry up. I want this one wing panel to be wet. It really doesn't matter how I do it. I've got the pressure down to about 15 pounds, so it's not putting out a lot of paint at all. I don't know if you can see, it depends on what kind of, how you have your TV adjusted. The really nice color that this presents. I want it to be wet, but without a run. And when you put it on with very low pressure, that's how it, you just have to keep going, be going back and forth. Now it could be that when Bob Brookins does it, with a, an automotive style of painting, you get more material on in one shot. See, I'm not putting a lot of material on here. But I'm hoping it's going to go on thin enough that when I sand this with 1200 a month or two from now, let's just see how this looks when you can. Let's see, I can still see there's still a couple of dry spots. Let's see if we can pick them out. Dry spot right there. I can just hit that again. But that's some of the tricks you can use to make the clear go on. See up here it's plenty wet. Down here we need to get a little more. Just candle it, always look up to the light. In this case we have plenty of sunlight today. And it should lay nice and flat. So we really did take good advantage of a day that was an exceptionally warm, dry day in the middle of this, uh, it's mounted to be a lousy winter. And that'll sit out here overnight. Tomorrow we'll bring it in the house.
And I feel like, I'm hoping that's going to be the end of the clear, but if we needed one other coat, if I found that I was going through, I guess it really wouldn't matter. There were all little pieces over here drying up. Every time I use Brodac dope, I just think, oh, can I, I can remember the good old days when this would have been an ordeal, and instead it's just breaded veal. Because there's some real neat stuff on Bruce Hunt's video relating to the B-25, and because now we have two people building B-25s, I just, it, this only going to run about five minutes, I want to splice this into the tape right about here. There's interesting stuff from Bruce Hunt.
And I thank Bruce Hunt for that and for all the things he's contributed over the years. It's that that kind of, I guess, friendship that develops when you do this kind of a project. Bruce, I appreciate it a whole lot, and all I can say is thanks a whole lot. We There's some other interesting stuff on that video. I may be splicing it as we get little breaks in the video. Break up the monotony of all the sanding and buffing and spraying. Again, it's real nice while everything is sitting here drying away like this. Boy, this is a good feeling. Anyway, I got something really neat here in a box. Got to share. Got to share this with you. But before we get back to work, now what this is? This is a Sato Gold Knight 100. And this is the first one I've seen. So, of course, I'm gonna I'm gonna be breaking this in. This motor belongs to Ron Merrill, and he supposedly has told me he's going to put it in a cardinal so one of the things worth mentioning and uh, I like that they have the the pressure fitting in the back now it just makes when they have the fitting up here it's hard to make the cowl but it's beautifully made unbelievable now this believe it or not would be legal in legal in the typhoon in fact now we gotta talk to this Ron guy, you know, while I break this engine in. Maybe he needs me to put a season of test flying on it for him. Oh, I just happen to have, because I'm doing, I have the 72 in in the uh, the Typhoon. I just happen to have the 91 out of it, and just sitting here, and what I wanna do is a comparative weight. Not down to the grain, but I wanna see how close we are anyway. Look at some of the other things that may be significant. Let's see if it, the, the hundred is a little bit higher, if you can see, I'm lining up the mounts. So it could be that they've lengthened the stroke. And you, for people like that care about that stuff, I mean, it really doesn't matter to me. What I care about, see, I have my carburetor running off to the side and held in with one screw. But what is significant is the quality, this thin finning. A beautiful piece of work. I can't wait to run this. I'm not going to get to run it today, it's already too late, but maybe tomorrow or the next day we'll get a break and run and get it all set up for him. He's also sending me a 91, so maybe we'll have two. I can do two in one day. Maybe I ought to just wait for the 91. What nice workmanship, though. Just for the record, the, the 91, the 100 is two and a half ounces on my scale heavier. And you can see how much longer it is. It's a bigger, it's a physically bigger motor. And I thought I had heard that they were using the same case. Well, that may or may not be it. I can't tell. It's not the same case. The mounts are different. But anyway, it's a significantly powerful motor, I'm sure. I can't wait to run it either. And, and it is two and a half, maybe a little more than two and a half when you count in. I didn't have the prop nut on this. But I'm not looking for grams, I'm looking for ounces. So I would say it's safe to say it's two and a half ounces heavier. And and a nose moment arm for this motor probably should be like in a range of maybe seven inches if it's gonna be on a normal size 750 inch stun ship. The two of them, things I'd like to try, I didn't even think about this before, is to see if the if the 100 muffler fits on the 90 and vice versa and gives you more choices because of course you can buy these mufflers separately for about $25. So for whatever reason, if you want it to tinker or move the CG or just make it louder or quieter or whatever, a lot of choices. We'll be getting to run that soon. Just a little bit of time left today. And what I wanted to show was, and we had worked on these previously, you could still see the seam, but not to worry. The trick now is another wet sanding, and I'll do that off camera, and another coat of silver. And next time, I'll go back over this two or three times with some extras. In other words, I'm building up a, what I call a skim coat right on the seams. These are so light. If, you, if I just used heavier wood, 
you, the reason you see the seam is the seam is heavy, is hard, and the wood around it is so punky soft. But we'll get that seam to disappear before we go to the next step. Now, what, what the reason we're doing all this sanding and painting right now instead of doing some woodwork? Two things: we're waiting for our cowling mold so we can start the nacelles. We don't want to put the wing in a body until I get some drawings from Dave Downey, and they should be here tomorrow. He has some drawings of wing cutouts and they sell side views, so we're basically playing a waiting game right now. These are so nice. And they really have the look of B25. When you stick them on the end of the stab, they really do look like B25 parts. I wanted to show this as a point of reference because this is this is one of the little things that a lot of people uh, maybe could they could benefit by. Um, just just quickly before I get another coat of silver on here. And of course the silver comes right off. That's not a problem at all. But I really want to use M600 here because I've noticed, see there's a low spot there, a low spot there where if a little bit of water got in there or whatever, I'd be in trouble. Now see how, see how the silver builds it. Now what I did, I went back and forth over this four or five times. Well, kind of skim coated it in. Well now, when I put the next coat on here, maybe one coat or even two coats more, this should totally, totally blend that in. So we go from having a visible seam or a seam that we really want to bury, and this is the easiest way I know of to bury it. Now with all the silver pieces ready for spraying, I'm ready for the next coat, which I hope, again, every time I do this, if it doesn't look perfect, I sand it and do it again, and that's the secret. doesn't matter if you do it. Each time I do this, the parts are getting one or two grams lighter because I'm getting more and more of the base off of it, and it's getting smoother at the same time. Now, I'm going to see if it's still light out there. I can get some silver on here and get this drying. we got a lot of other stuff to work on here tonight. Am I glad? Am I glad we got out here? It feels like it's getting ready. To, it goes from being a beautiful day to snow. It was ready to snow any minute now. Look at this. This this was a bright sunny day a half an hour ago. An hour ago. Now you can tell we're really tap dancing around the weather here. But again, I'm hoping this is going to be the last time or one of the last times we have to spray the silver. I'm going back over the spot, back around the edges, so that they get extra. That's one way of keeping the weight down without sacrificing the finish. And of course the wind is blowing, and I see snowflakes, so... Amazing, this weather. I'm moving to Anaheim, that's all there is to it. Anyway, some good news is we have some new Brodak paint coming next week. A new color of silver that we may be able to uh, use on the B25. I'm not sure. Still working on that with the people at Randolph. If we're not satisfied with this in the end, it's a simple case. We'll go back and do this as many times as necessary. It sure has that look like we've beat the weather. Anyway, I got this stuff out here drying. I wanted to see. This is typically what I do to dry it. I have the fan going up there. Get all my silver stuff dry in here. Now we'll let it sit out here the rest of the day, bring it in tonight once it outgasses. The way, the way to tell when it's done, smell it. If you smell it and there's no smell, well, you ask Karen, she'll tell you if there's no smell. Anyway, back to work. This, getting this stuff up into final silver is a major step forward for us. Not great enough, even as we have a couple of snowflakes out there. Back in the shop, and I wanted to look at, this is Dave Downey's drawing, showing the nacelles at every station. Again, now that we have two people building these, I'll pass one copy on. I'm looking at now one of the things I'm going to have to do I'm almost sure by the way the tail drawing is now finished and that's great one of the things I'm going to have to do to even have a small chance 
of having this balance is extend the nose maybe an inch I'm looking at it and, then, and I'm going to try to make some cardboard cutouts here and get an idea if an inch would really detract I don't think we can go more than an inch but just give us some fighting chance of getting the weight forward in the plane anyway that's the thing I'll think about tonight tomorrow we'll get back to the shop and start some uh, start working on the next part of this project now for Christmas I just had to show this this is so cool <coughs> my wife gets me a a pad that has a calculator. Of course, I'm supposed to calculate how much money I make, but but check it out. So the idea is, if you can't afford a real bird, and I'm not so sure I can either, if you want to have peeps in your, you just touch them, and he makes that sound. So you're sitting working on your email or something, and you need a little companionship. I thought that was a great little gift. There's nothing like a real bird. Bertnowski, you're a bird. Hey. Chicky, we have B25s to work and we can't play today. By the way, his latest thing. He eats waffles. I had a waffle left over for breakfast the other day. He, he ate almost a whole waffle. It's unbelievable. Waffles, Chicky. Can't wait to run that Sato either. I just hope it doesn't we don't get killed with weather here for the next couple days. today all our stuff dried up nicely overnight in the garage I have it all in the house now that it's dry it can go up by a heating vent here everything looks like that's going to dry up nicely but while this is drying up and this this was a major thing to be able to get all that clear on a plane and these next couple of coats of silver not sure that'll be the last coat we have some tricky stuff happening over at Randolph we're going to try to come up with another another different shade of silver for this plane which may become a Brodak color we don't know yet we're going to see how that works out later this week for right now what I want to do is some of the other detail work on the plane well, it's always nice in the morning to just survey everything that we've gotten accomplished so far knowing that we have the Z-tron that part of it done the blocks hollowed the clear on Miss Ashley it's it's starting to really shape up and what what may or may not be the last coat of silver on the tail one of the things I wanted to do this morning too, I can take, the, this has been drying for a while, I can take the tape off this, get this roughly sanded out, and do a little bit of a test fit. I can start fitting up the bulkheads for the take apart system. Sand this out, and if it looks like we're going to run short of time, the last thing of the day, glass the center of the wing, that'll just keep it more stable while we do a lot of extra work. Now I was going to try not to glass the center of the wing until I had these bulkheads on so I could run the glass right up onto the bulkheads, maybe gain a little strength that way, I don't know, without making it a lot heavier. But There were three or four ideas I had here as far as the bulkheads go. I'm not sure any of them are going to work out until I actually cut that piece out and do a little fitting. But the first thing I guess, and I ought to get the sequence of this right, see sequencing this gets to be a pain first thing I had to do is get this center section all smoothly sanded out so even if I don't glass it, when I do get to glass it, I can lay it right in this valley and up on the bulkheads. I can one continuous piece of glass doing that job. And sequencing this stuff up can be a little bit of a problem. I want to smooth this joint out but I don't want to make take any more material off than I really have to. It's real tempting to, to make a nice smooth joint that uh, the skins get real thin in here, and I don't want to do that. Just a just a minimum sanding. Again, it may be a good idea, and I'm just thinking of things. It may be a good idea to put before I because oh, I want to do all this glass work in one shot. Is to get one band-aid down the center of this. I call it a band-aid, a thin piece just to, so while I'm working on it, it's, I may have to do that. I'm, well, as I look at this, that may be the best way to do it. And I need to adjust this hole so that the push rod has a little more, just a little more clearance on that side. To do is, <coughs> I made sure this joint is smooth without thinning it any more than I have to. And what I'm trying to do is I just made sure that I don't have any gaps where this CA would run down into the 
into the foam and melt the foam. But I want to put a thin bead of CA. Just to harden up the wood at the joint, because getting this joint, this is going to be the, probably the highest stress joint in the whole plane. The nacelles are going to want to pull a wing apart here. Gravity's going to want to spam load it. So we don't, this is one joint I want real good integrity on. As soon as that kicks a little bit, and again, I'm trying not to thin the wood, just to get a nice mechanically sound joint without thinning the wood. Again, we had so many choices here, and I've gone over this and done this in my mind so many times. I'm not sure exactly which is going to be the best, but we're certainly going to go about it. And we'll get some of these steps done today. And as you do more steps, there's less choices you have to make. You kind of kind of get locked into some of these things, whether they're right or wrong. That joint has been coming out real nice. What I'm trying to do is just trim just enough of this away, envisioning that the horn will be in the center. I don't want to make the hole any bigger than it has to be. I probably could take just a little more, but for right now, I don't want to make this hole get off of here any bigger than it has to be. And also, if you look down here, you can make sure nothing's binding there. Okay, we're ready to do a little test fit on this. You can see how this, the leading edge, the center line has lined up. We have the same line at the trailing edge. A good beginning clearance. That is a problem. When we mount the horn on the back of this, and we don't have the horn yet. May or may not come today, tomorrow. But the horn is going to go straight across here. But, but the problem is, I need to line up the wing with the center line on the fuselage. In other words, I can't line up the center of the horn, the center of the, I need to line up this center line of the wing front and back with the two center lines that are on the fuselage. So maybe it would be easier to dry fit this in before I even put the horn on again. That's something I, I really wasn't sure which way I was going to go. What I'll do is I'll get the fuselage and I'll cut that piece out and just get some idea of how this is going to dry fit up. do anything I want to clear this whole table off scrape the glass table so I have a perfectly flat work surface for doing all my alignments and when, no matter when I do an alignment I always want to double check that the table hasn't gone out of level because of humidity or with somebody like me sitting on the end of it now this will be a relatively critical thing to line up the two center lines on those two center lines I need to make up the front and back bulkheads and then this this will really be just a temporary dry fit just to see if that's going to line up as I expect it will. Now if it doesn't, you know, we're going to have to start inventing things as we go along here. But for right now, I have to hope for the best. Now I always check before I'm doing any kind of alignment. A couple of things, and this is a really critical thing couple of things that really always pay. Set aside a time of the day, and it's early in the morning, when I have some uh, en some energy level anyway. And before I go any further, because this table, with the humidity in the shop and different other things, tends, tends to stay good for a while and then go out. And this is the part of the table I do an X pattern. It looks like we're in... Uh, close. This is the part of the table that we're going to use, so I want to make sure. And then I always do a sight. It's really the exact edge of the table I'd like to have perfect if possible. And a good way to check this too is always flip the ruler over. Double check yourself. By double checking yourself, if the ruler was crooked, which this one is a pretty good ruler, decent anyway, and I have two of them, so I always have a way of double checking this, because if we were to line this up on a table that had a bow in it, 
Forget it. What do is take all the blocks off of here. So that I can work off the top. Now, if this were a traditional stunner, I'd be working off this top edge as... Let me pull this off. Like I said, try getting it off. There we go. A traditional stunner, we'd be working off this edge as our center line, but this line is not exactly parallel to this line. So we're just going to tack glue this to the table, but we're only referencing this center line. This center line is what counts, not the distance from the table. And that's an important thing I have to remember. Now, I probably won't be reusing that, that piece, maybe just as a pattern. So I want to trim it off undersize, and then as I fit the wing in, I can take the last little bit away. Now you can see how much I left a good, well, more than an eighth of an inch in every dimension. I don't need this piece anymore. I'll just save it just for using as a pattern. But this last little bit, now I'll do this very carefully with a sanding block or a Dremel tool to get it right on the edge. And of course, make sure that everything is parallel. But it's this center line here, and because it's a wood joint, we can never lose it, even if we go into silver and we want to recover it for whatever reason. Now I can shave this down real gradually, and the last little bit I'll take out with the sandpaper. And I want to go right up to our center line, but not past it. See, that's how much extra I had, and I want to get that last little bit out. Now, what this has given me is a complete flat face that extends out past this wood. And what I'll do before I go to the next step, I'll get all of these edges in, and then I'll seal these with thin CA, so I'm working off a hard edge here, because that's going to be a separation line in the final plane. Again, part of, the, part of the challenge here is laying out what step comes before what step. And by leaving this oversized, this will allow me when I actually I put the bulkheads in next with the screws, and then I can drop the wing, glue the wing to the bulkheads, and then when I take out the screws, I should in essence have my some good chance of having, maintaining the alignment. Famous last words, I know. Okay, now the next part of this, I need to figure out the shape of my plywood bulkhead, and I'll do that with a 90 degree triangle. Now, there's a trick to doing this that I found that works, well, works for me anyway. As I make out the part, I'll make the part at eighth, ordinary eighth inch plywood. Then I'll drill one hole in it, put one bolt in, and while that's bolted in place, use that and drill whatever. I think they'll put three, well, with two and three, or three and two, or two and two, I'm not sure. But use one bolt. If you try to drill two holes at once, you seem to never get them lined up. So if you put one bolt in to hold it in place, and then use the second one, drill both parts at the same time, you get a much better, I think, a much better chance of getting the parts all lined up. And this is one of the things we're really looking for, getting this alignment. This part of it, real accurate. And I want those bolt, both of those bulkheads bolt, bolted in place before I start dropping that wing in position and taking that last little bit of material out of there. Now, a good tip, and I, this is a great tip, no matter what kind of modeling you're use, doing. This came from John Pothier. I tried this, and it worked so well, I couldn't believe it. It's to score the plywood. Again, I'm using a uh, number 26 blade. Put a nice, decent score in the plywood. And then when you go over to the jigsaw, the blade tends to ride right in that little groove. And the first time I did that, I says, oh, well, I don't know. Then I really came back, put a good score in it, put two or three good knife marks in it, and, and it's almost like you could walk away and the blade stays right in that groove. It's an excellent trick. You know, the other trick I found is with cutting, 
This is 8 inch plywood. Just cut slow. The slower you cut, it seems like you can hold a line. I've clamped the extra bulkhead on there. I drilled the two holes. And now what I want to do is just with with a bar, not a drill, a bar, just spot each one of these. But I want to get one bolt in position first before I run this drill through. And boy, that just gets a nice, a, that's a real nice way if you have to drill two holes to so make sure they both line up. Now with one bolt and blind that in place, now I just can run the burr right through here and spot this. That'll give me a, like a pilot hole, and then I can work work off of that with the drill and get the blind up the second one, and they should line up really, really well. Now I have the pilot hole that the burr made. Now I need to drill a, a 145 hole so it's a tight fit to the blind nut. Get the blind nut in there. Notice I've made the blind nut sit just far enough out there's an advantage to having the bolts as far apart as possible. You wouldn't want them in like this. There's more strength, you get a bigger footprint, the wider you can make them, but I didn't want to go out into the fuselage side, and I wanted to be able to get the wrench in there and make some kind of little access to that, which I haven't decided how to do that yet. So I always drill the, the blind nut holes. I have a drill, a 145, that makes a nice tight fit to the blind nuts. Now the burr makes a real good pilot hole. And that should give me a really nice tight fit on the blind nuts. Now a drop of two oil on the bolts, or chain lube or something, so that the CA doesn't lock the bolt in. And we've got another step out of the way. I'll repeat the same thing on the front for whatever bolt pattern looks like we're going to work on. Going one more step out of this. Now this I'm sure is going to be oversized and I'm going to have to do some grinding or cutting or shaping but we'll wait till we actually fit the ring in to do that. Now because I had to make a decision here do I want to try to get the bolts in from this side and I thought well one of the things I wanted to do on this plane and I don't know is, is minimize how many bolts are showing. I think I can put little tubes in here. Maybe, maybe not, I don't know. Another thought that I had, because we've never built this plane before, is to make a scale bomb door that, was, that could be opened so I could get in and get the bolts. And the other part was, I had to make some little notches in here for right now because these formers are gonna be in here until we finish all this nose work, and then we'll maybe pull some of them out. But I thought, what well, would be good if I make this whole nose section from, from the wing to the front here with the landing gear and everything. If I make that, and again, I've been thinking about this in different ways, like a, a cowling would be on a plane, like a nobler cowling, that could just sit right on there. The, the wheel could stay bolted in position. And then I could move all my electronics, nose weight. I would have access to this whole area. So as long as I'm going to make that hatch, I may as well make the bolts go in from the front, just to make it a little bit easier. Now, eventually what we're going to do with these we're going to have to have a, a hole cut in here so wires from the Z-Tron can go back and forth to the servos. We know that some of this wood can be ground away. Once I grind this away and get the trailing edge of the wing in position with the horn, it is, there's still a lot of factors here, still a lot of unknown stuff. But this was a big thing, just getting to this point. And I can still get in there for temporarily and get those screws in and out. But the next thing I want to do is just do a little dry fit on the wing piece. The reason I've gone with this type of a take apart system, because we've built two planes, we actually built three so far, with, with this similar system, and it's been, for all purposes, it's been dead reliable. So I didn't want to get too cute here and try to invent some kind of new system with different brakes and joints. Now, the other thing that's different is on a plane like this with a, with a motor is in the front, this, I realize I've done 
something by adding the extra two bolts there that's really, I hope, going to firm that up. And there's really no, I, I think you could get away with using two bolts, but in this case, because we're so paranoid, I guess is the right word, about having a tail-heavy plane and we know we're going to add nose weight, the weight's in front of the CG. I'm not going to really Mickey Mouse around too much trying to make that part of the plane ultralight. And I figured the two extra bolts, the good, the part of it that I like is if one bolt were to either snap or come out or get loose in the middle of, uh, you know, a long day at the field, nothing bad would happen. I just thought that was cheap insurance. Now, another thing I know for sure, in the past I've had, I've, I've tried to do, uh, just use two bolts, and I was real unhappy with that, and I added the third bolt. But I also, the other thing I wanted to do here, I wanted to extend this bulkhead back and maybe make a little fake fuselage side that could go back to the bell crank mount on this plane because they, we don't have any plywood doublers in here. So what's going to happen is when you pull test the plane and you're holding it from outside here, I just thought this would be a good way to do it is make a fuselage side that goes inside the side, kind of beef it up. It would also add some rigidity to this bulkhead too without adding a lot of weight. But again, my motive is to use as many proven things. There's so many experimental parts of this plane that I I don't need to make it any any more difficult at this point in time. In fact, this this is already to the point where I, I hope all of these things are going to work well for us. Now one of the problems with take apart is at this point in time, this part of the plane gets to be the weak joint. And it gets real flimsy once you cut that section out. It's like, it just gets real easy to, to get it twisted, bent, or whatever. So I'm going to pay real strict attention to make sure I don't, at this point in time, start building some stress in here that I really don't want to have. Now, again, my center line is not the, the base of the table. I'm just using the table to hold everything flat and parallel while I drop that wing in. And as I drop it in, I'm going to take one eye shaving after another until I get a well, a semi-reasonable fit here anyway. And I know this is going to take a lot of time. This is not going to be a five minute. It, I don't want to start this at four o'clock at night, six o'clock at night, supper's on, come on upstairs, company comes over. I want it to have this in a part of the day before the phone starts ringing. Typically I can work up until about one o'clock before it gets hectic. And I want, I want to really, really pay attention to get this part in there the way I want it. Now the other the other item is by not having the extra piece on the wing, it just makes this job a little bit easier. If I had to deal with a 70 inch span wing, well wow, I'd be you know I'd be all, all over the place here. I have the two bulkheads bolted in place, and I have the wing sanded, and now it's a question again of just very easily dropping that place, seeing where it needs to get shaved. And I really, you know, I've been going back and forth about how I want to glass this. I was going to glass just that middle of the wing, and I may still do that. I, want to, I, I don't want to, what I wanted to really accomplish was to get the glass that goes on the wing to go right up on the bulkhead, of course, and in the back maybe too, so that would be really nice and rigid. And then what I think I'm going to do, in fact, I may do this before I, well, I ought to fit the wing first. What I want to do is make kind of a, a fake bulkhead, a fake bulkhead, and maybe a piece of broomstick or plywood so I can hold that while I'm working on it. Again, I'll see if, I, if that looks like it's going to be appropriate. And then at some point in time, and I need to decide what, when it's going to be, I need to cut this whole top out before I glue the block on. Now see, I would not want to have the block glued on now. And again, remember, it's, this, is what's, this is what's so challenging, is getting all these sequential things that you don't build yourself into a corner. Also, I need to have enough of the material cut out back here, possibly U-shaped cut out, or something that I can get in there when I go to put the wing in and hook up the push rod. So thinking of all of those possibilities, it's just given me plenty of time to think of how I want to do this. Now I know this is going to be challenging because I need to really start little by little and I want to maintain that center line. Maintaining that center line and getting all the fits real nice and tight, that's right now that's such, such to me, such a critical thing that I need to work on. I 
was even thinking, suppose I get this whole thing done, I have the wing in upside down. Ah! Anyway, can't do that. Go pay attention to what you're doing. Hey, I fed Chicky. He's going to help me line this wing up while well, he's eating his blue bird. this bird. That center line that we have on our crutch, well, we can use that center line now to line up the center of the wing. We can kind of make our little adjustment here. But what I want to do, I want to put some blue tape just temporarily on the outside of the wing, showing where it'll sit. So every time I go to fit this, because remember, I'm going back and forth, taking little, you can see how much I've already taken out, taking little slivers out. I want to make my final adjustment, and without this being crooked one way or the other. Now I also can check, there's a lot of other ways I can check. I can check point to point to center line, to joint, trailing edge to the point, because these two, once that gets set in place and dries, that's that's the, the main lineup piece of the whole plane, and I would expect this is going to take the better part of the day or, or more to get this where I'm going to be satisfied with it. Now, I found it a little bit helpful anyway to lay out tape also so I can get kind of an idea of where exactly the center is. And of course, what's nice with a foam wing, you're working off a center line constantly. It's one of the one of the little advantages you have. That's a little bit of By having that tape on there, now that just allows me, gives me a little bit of a better eyeball look when I drop that down onto the fuselage. As I'm getting the ring closer and closer to its final fit, I need to allow some clearance for the push rod. I may have to even take a little more of that out. But as I'm dropping it down, every time I go another sixteenth of an inch or so, I see that I'm I pick up the spot where the push rod is hitting and just take a little more material out of there. And you can see I've got a little bit of a test fit on there. Just use some videos or whatever to prop it up. But the blue tape really is a help getting it lined up. I'm trying to figure out, see part of this is I'm trying to figure out the, the really the best way to do this. I also need to take into account that right from the front, I don't want to have it up one way or another when I get the final fit on this, but this is just going to be a back and forth, back and forth, very, very time consuming thing. Now after a lot of fiddling and fooling that you don't really see on camera, I have that part okay. The wing just touches exactly where I want it to. Back here there's a gap that I intended to leave for the horn, but I guess we have no choice now. And luckily, everything lined up on center relatively quickly. Now I've got to do a little file, and you can see how much more material I can take off back there. I'll get that fine-tuned. But what I thought would be a good way to do this, and because I don't have a <laughs> I don't have that many choices, I haven't done this kind of thing before. What I want to do is I'm gonna take and put some slow dry in epoxy, just put a dab of it right up in the front, kind of tack glue that in for right now. Because I don't want to, rather than file that flat, I want to put filler blocks in there. I don't want to take a chance. I'm, a, I'm just a little nervous about making anything in the center of the wing weak. Then if everything lines up the way I want it to, I was thinking I'll just put a little temporary piece back here. Again, I, the problem with all of this is I have to invent it as I go along. Because I haven't really done this before, and I have to maintain that center line right down the wing. So it looks like that part of it's going to work for us. My primary alignments here, because I'm supposedly on a flat table, is I can measure down to the table on this side, come around here, measure down on this side, and I can do a final, I'll use my machinist rule to get exact, use this bird, get exactly the same amount of distance off the table. So you would think that I have a chance of lining, that would give me a good starting point since I've got this center line lined up and maybe just by moving it just ever so slightly to get the, the dihedral breaks exactly where I want them. Now it turns out that I have exactly a quarter of an inch. And so that gives me a good spot to start with See, but by tacking this in first, like I'm going to do, then I can take it apart once that 
that five, I guess five minutes is okay. Just want to put a very slight tack joint up there and work from that tack joint. And then I can, if it isn't right, I can break it away. I can move it. Then I'll try to get a piece back here that'll just help me hold, maybe two little pieces. Just help me hold that in alignment because again, I, I don't have the horn yet. Horn may not be here for a few days. In the meantime, I don't want to lose any time. But this little jig fixture here for doing the primary alignment, I think will work just fine. Now, as I did a little more fine tuning and just sanding that bottom piece so that wing drops right in place. One of the things I found was the quarter inch was just a little bit too much. So what I did, I lined up some sheets of 16 and 32nd, and I can vary it with sheets of 32nd balsa now. So that when these two points touch, the two wing tips touch at exactly the same time. And that's that's one of the things I tape the wood down because the wood is kind of soft. I don't want every time I walk by or the bird flies by, move the wood. So by making this little jig up, and this took a quite a bit of little timing to do, it seems like now I'm I'm comfortable that I have a good chance at getting this alignment right right in the very beginning rather than having to do it over six or seven or eight or ten times. And you can see I've just had to take little oh just the slightest little bit because remember I cut these sides I didn't cut them I estimated that using the center rib and this, this wing tapers so I know I would have to leave a 16th a 64th some amount but that worked out just about as well as you could imagine and I'm on I'm touching on all four spots when I look at it from several different angles no matter what angle I look at it from it seems like it's in good alignment And if, it's, if this part of it isn't right, boy, is it going to be a job to change it. So actually, what I think I'll do, and because I'm a coward more than anything else, I'll make some temporary little pieces to just hold this in place. And what I can do then is once I have the, the wing part, the end parts on, then I can line up the tail and everything all at once. And if they're wrong, I can just change little braces rather than make a print. In other words, I'll try to keep this joint as temporary as possible right now. The advantage of having temporary joints is, if you have to make an adjustment off to get the phone, you can make it later on. Anytime this kind of thing, anytime you can make a temporary joint that'll be easy to break, just strong enough to hold it in position while you do the rest of the alignment. Then when we want to make it a permanent, it, it'll be relatively easy to make it a permanent piece. But if it's if it's if you make it permanent and then it's off a little bit, oh, to have to cut in by those skins and everything. Also, what this will allow me to do is get in here when I do the fiberglass work and get right up here onto the bulkhead. So this is one piece. The whole thing becomes one solid unit. And I hope that I'll gain a little bit of strength that way. And if I don't, it didn't hurt anything. It's, it's, it's either going to be free lunch or no lunch at all. Okay, that little temporary epoxy is dried. Now I want to make up a little brace that will connect. Well, maybe two. I'm not sure how I want those a little piece to connect the, the bulkhead to the wing with as big of a footprint. We're looking for a giant footprint here, big as possible. Get a little temporary pattern, just just a pattern for how I want this to look. And then you just cut this out of a, I don't know, I guess a piece of scrap top block. There's plenty of oversize. What I'm going to have to do, I'm going to shorten this up because I want the glass this is the high point of the wing. I want the glass to really reinforce. So I'm going to just cut this down right now. And then what I have to do in the bottom, I have to relieve it because that take into account that little angle and I'd like a nice tight fit. But start with an oversized block, of course. Now what this will allow me to do is get more glass in here span-wise. I didn't want to break that up. And we're going to put permanent pieces in here, permanent fuselage sides, of course. This is, this is for all purposes now, just a temporary thing. You see I've got a little bit of a valley cut in there. I'm going to glue this in with some slow drying epoxy and put this aside to dry. And again, just make up the pattern. Pretty much replicate the same thing in the back. And that one's drying up. While that one's drying up, I can be making up the other part. 
happy with the pattern. I can trace it up on the wider wood, leaving some clearance there because we know we have to fit the horn. As soon as I have the grain going corner to corner, not front to back, it gives me a little more strength there, a little more rigidity really for free. And I'll do the same thing when I make this piece up, get the grain orientation going point to point. To get this angle of fit here to be real nice, of course I have this sticky back sandpaper as a good starting point. And because these are just really temporary fixtures, I can get almost exactly the angle I want. You can just keep working this part until I get a nice tight fit. Because I don't want that all filled up with epoxy anyway. Now, once that sets up and dries, we'll be able to take this apart, look at it from a lot of different angles, see if we're satisfied with it, and in, it, and in, in essence, we'll have a this the basic alignment of the take apart system. And I can get a, a look as to whether this is lined up accurately. Again, if it isn't, we're only in temporary, temporary things here that we can adjust. Check for accuracy here. I can two inches. Oh, looks real close. But no matter what angle I look at it from, it seems to look real good, real accurate. Needless to say. Once I put the, the pieces on each tip, then I'll really have to spend some time getting a final, final adjustment on that. So I'd count that that was relatively successful today. I want to take it all apart and just look inside, make sure I can get, I can take the blue tape off now. Now with these pieces both, that I can take them apart, put them back together, this is really a major step forward, and, like, and they're not really permanently attached. If I really had to, I could just slice that and make some adjustment. But right now that looks like that was probably one of the best days we've had so far. Now next time we get to work on this, I'm going to think about how I want to join these Wing panels, I need to make sure I have the dihedral break accurate. But that'll be the next step is joining this oil into a one-piece wing now that I have a temporary fit in the body. And then re recheck all the alignments. And then I think this temporary system that I uh, kind of improvised here, I think this is going to work well. So we'll get back on this tomorrow. Now today what I wanted to do is I wanted to figure out the dihedral angles as accurately as possible. Now keep in mind in the real plane it's the center line of this that's level. So it isn't, e it isn't going to work to have it laying down flat on the table as a jig. This side has to come up and it has to come up half of the thickness so we maintain that center line. At least if I'm reading the drawing right this is going to need to come up a small amount anyway. And I have to figure out how much that amount is. Then I need to figure out, I want to get the both center lines right on center and then make sure I have a good clean joint to glue to. Now the same as when we did this dihedral angle, this one was already cut in at a real close angle so there wasn't much dressing off to do. But what I did is laid it flat figured out how much I had to go and I, I can see I have oh, just maybe a sixty-fourth of an inch. I'll dress this edge off just a little bit and we should be in good shape. And I'll be ready to join. Now what I'm going to do is join one panel 
let that totally dry, then do the other panel. Again, I can use a shim on the one side and use these two sides as flat. So the idea being when I do the other side, if I use the same shim, well, then you would think I have a good chance of getting the V because this is a polyhedral angle. It just makes something that's relatively difficult put some, uh, some constants in it. And most important of all is to keep the center lines in the front. When we do that, center line the whole thing equally. It's going to be kind of a neat looking wing when it's done. Now with the dry fit, just to get a rough look from a couple different angles, what that polyhedral is going to look like. I like to look at it from a lot of different angles. Now because we cut these dihedral angles in when we did the original two pieces, these really needed one swipe at a sanding block, just very little to get them to line up. But the next thing I want to do is I want to permanently attach with the one, the outer one, doesn't matter which. Get the glue drying on one. When that one dries, then I'll do this one, or vice versa, get them both dry. And then actually, if I get that done today, tomorrow, I can do the, start to do the glassing and sanding. some idea how that dihedral is going to look in the final model. Of course you really you really can't tell till when the cells are on. Have this mixed up, slow drying epoxy, this will be 45 minute dry. I'm just getting a little bit brushed on each edge, letting it set up just a little bit. Now before I put it together I'm going to take the heat gun and just warm it just a little bit. It'll soak into the end grain wood just a little bit better then. And then I need to tape these joints in place the same way that we did the center section with a little shim in place. Once that gets liquidy, then you can see it just soaks right into the end grain. Even if you had just joined in the center of a wing, and I don't like to get a whole lot dripping down onto the, the foam because let's face the fact, how much strength is the foam going to add to this? But it's right in that end grain of the wood that I want to get the, the most of it. I'll do the same thing to the other side. We'll be ready to tape these in position. We're going to do the same thing to this side too. It gives the glue a lot better penetration when you do that. You just need to get it down into that end grain balsa wood. glue is good and sticky. I'm just getting this rough together. Get it close and then I'll put it in a jig and then re-tighten up all the tape. Once I get this in good tension, this is a little bit of isopropyl alcohol just to get a little bit of the extra that oozes out. Then I want to lay this over and put my little shim underneath it because then I'll know that I've got both sides relatively equal and then whichever side if it's a little low or high I can adjust the tension on a tape if it's only a sixty-fourth of an inch or so. And I can see the only thing I'm going to have to do here is just a little bit of sanding on the leading edge to blend that in. That won't be a big deal. My radius here on one panel is just a little bit different than the other one, but that's easy to sand that out once that's done. 
pin will help hold the center line on this. And that is the single most important thing, is keeping those center lines lined up. Now one panel on this, I, I need to put the shim underneath it. One panel needs to dry before I even start the other one. Now with that piece centered, laying flat, I can just slide my shim right under there. I just want to catch the edge of it, so while it dries it won't tend to droop. And that has to sit there. If I wanted to speed it up now, if I was in a rush or had no other projects, you could use a little hair dryer heat. When it's done, this piece needs to be adjusted, a little bit of sanding. If the center lines are on, that, that really does have that, that Mitchell kink in a wing. Alright, we'll come back to this once that panel's dry. Now the first side dried perfectly. And I'm just replicating the same thing on this side. And I'll put it back in a fixture. Again, even if you just have some little ideas of how to make up some of these jigs inexpensively, or if you can custom make one for your own personal use. And that would cover any plane. Wouldn't matter if semi-scale, regular plane or not. Just having that idea of how to do some of these things, it's at least helped me. Okay, I have the shim under here. I cut a piece of shim exactly the same on both sides. And it looks like what I'll have to do from this point on is just let it dry overnight. Let it stay right in that fixture. In the morning come out, maybe we can even put a little heat on these seams. Although the first one is already dry already. And we're ready to come back to this tomorrow. Maybe even get all the glassing done tomorrow. Boy, I'd love to get the glassing done. Now, after the wing drying up, the next step that I wanted to do, I wanted to put the whole plane, I wanted to put the tail in, bolt it in, bolt the wing in, and check that I have everything in good alignment because I can still move it. I can still make fine adjustments before I put those permanent little sides on in the front and the back. So after this alignment is checked, and assuming this is going to work out okay, or I spend the minimum time doing this, then I want to get ready for one of the major operations here, and that is to get the gold. Now I'm trying to look at it again from a lot of angles, that it's in good alignment with the tail. And then the next thing I want to do, I want to measure from my center line here and triangulate everything and then do hinge line to hinge line. So once I get that I'm happy that all those dimensions are going to be okay, then the next thing I'm going to get the ring sanded out and ready for glassing. Now it looks like we've got this dimension, hinge line to the point of dihedral very equal. That worked out almost perfectly. It really starting to look like a B25 here. And as far as the tail, you know, when I line it up and drop it right down into the dihedral breaks, that looks pretty good. Again, we could always do, if we were out just the thickness of a piece of paper, we could shim this or in some way adjust it, but it looks like it's pretty good right now. As a kind of a double check, even though this is all bolted together, I, I put a little bit of a score on a piece of balsa wood. And I can measure from that point to the hinge line. It 
because one thing with take apart planes there's always a little bit of adjustment a 64th of an inch and this it's amazing that this worked out as well as it did because I thought with something this complex this would be a lot more of a you know an operation than it is it turned out that this worked out very well now I also could check and this would be another check here is a corner into my center line Yeah, I'm referencing everything off the center line here. I think I'm just lucky. <laughs> but anyway, now that we know the center line is a good reference and we've got the wing and tail both in parallel and both looking from the front straight, I can take the wing out, feel comfortable that I'm sanding and glassing it without having to make any more adjustments on this. And I have just maybe the thickness of a piece of 64th plywood clearance. When I make the final fit there, I'll lay in a, probably a piece of 64th plywood or something like that. I still have to cut out for the horn, so there's still a lot of little detailing to do. The important thing, too, is that it's from that front. I don't know if I can't see through the lens cap, but that tail looks like it's in straight that in that dimension. So I would count. Count that we're very lucky. And we're ready to pull that apart and sand and glass that wing out. Now in the old days, <coughs> when I remember making my foam wings years ago, what they would do is they would put a, a spar, a light ply spar in a wing. And then typically you would take, and I'm just, just referencing this off because I know there are other people, including Bruce Hunt, that are making foam wings, they would do this, is just put a little piece of glass down the middle of the fuselage. Now, the couple of things that I saw happen over the years, many, many times, and I mean many times, what would happen, the spar would start working its way up through the sheeting and cause a ripple in the sheeting in time, especially if you had gear blocks. That would always be a problem. Second of all, a lot of people would just, they'd mount the fuselage sides to 16th balsa. Now, this is even worse, I mean, in the worst of all worlds, when, when you glue a plane together, you're gluing a plywood fuselage side, think about it, to a piece of 16th balsa wood. Well, that's not so good either. Now, I think a better way, and this is the way Big Jim Greenaway taught me to do it, and it's, it's worked perfectly for me. I have had a 100% success rate with wings that are done this way. Is first off is always where there's a joint. We, don't, we want to put some fiberglass cloth down there to cover that joint up. But the high point of the wing is where the stress is happening. And we would put three ellipses. If you look at the cardinal plans, you don't need to glass the trailing edge of the wing. See, this, this is what a lot of people, they kind of miss the boat here. Back here, nothing's happening. This is, this is not where the stress is. The stress is right here at the height. It wants to break the wing right here. So we spread this load out with three glass ellipses. Now, because the B-25 wing has other joints, we're going to have to be creative. And I just wanted to show this. This is a method when you use the three glass ellipses, half ounce cloth, either West resin or SIG resin, this wing now has all of the weight and all of the strength concentrated in the area where you need it the most. And back here, when you tissue the wing, tissue this wing to here, tissue this wing to here. So what happens is right at the highest point of the wing where the stress is, you have a piece of foam, first of all, 16th balsa, three layers of glass, and two layers of tissue. Well, right where you need the strength the most. So I think, given the fact that I've had so many of these that have worked well and proven <laughs> tradition, for instance, totally bulletproof, this is the way we're going to try to improvise on the B25, and this is the way I would recommend anybody doing a foam wing, do their glassing. So what I always like to do is, first I'll sand out the wing, get everything very smooth and vacuum it. You don't want any dust on it. And get all my materials together. Plenty of half ounce glass cloth, resin. The two choices that I like the best is West 105 
with the slow hardener so I get plenty of working time because I put this to dry overnight anyway. Or the SIG 45 minute glue where one tube is twice as big as the other. Now if you, used, if you use West, you really don't need a hair dryer. You can use it, but if you use SIG, you absolutely have to have a hair dryer and we've done that enough times. We wanted a brand new SIG spatulas, a brand new one, and I say that because once you get them all rough on the end, they tear the e-glass. You're only good for one or two glass jobs. Some new blades to trim off any of the extra and some isopropyl alcohol. So once I get all my materials together, now the, the next step is to sand out the wing totally and get it ready for the glassing. Now the objective here of sanding is to get these joints smooth, get this air scissors, but not thin out the wood. I don't want to make the wood paper thin. Also, anywhere there's a joint and I'm going to glass it, I'd like to have that the joints are really, that you can you can almost not feel them without thinning it out. That's the whole point. And I will figure out ahead of time here. Now, I was thinking possibly what I'll do is I'll glass all the joints and make giant ellipses. Again, I have to, I have some time to think about this because there'll be a couple hours of sanding. I also need to work my way up into these joints here and after I'm done make sure I don't lose my center line. So there's quite a bit of little detail sanding to be done here. Best thing to use whether you have a, an, a, an, a, a top joint or a low joint it doesn't matter but the corner of that plane just lets you get right in there. But again the whole trick here is not to make it any thinner. Now the other thing is where we're going to mount the nacelles and maybe what I'll do is just glass the wing all the way out to here and be done with it. it the reason is the nacelles are going to mount to this and where the nacelles mount see I don't have to worry about the fuselage mounting to this because the stress is going to be taken here but I want the sides when I put the sides on I want the mounting on glass I don't want a mounting on soft balsa I mean, imagine how, how like wrong it is just to mount to soft balsa I want the glass running the whole span. That's the other thing. I don't want to just glass out here and glass here. I want it going underneath the nacelles, underneath here. And if I can get one piece going like a giant ellipse out maybe to here, all the way on the high spot of the wing, and maybe two layers here, a, a wide one and a narrow one, and I can blend that all in with the dope finish and bury all the joints in paint. That's relatively easy to do. Now as I'm finishing up the sanding, I'm giving everything a light sanding to 400. I'm breathing in all this, <coughs> all this stuff. But before I go any further, oh boy. Because I'm sanding on a padded table, I can't get by the vacuum bed. Before I go to even set up the table for glassing, one of the things I want to do is get this totally vacuumed up. I got what I think is going to be hopefully a final sanding on this. I don't want any dust around. As little, I'll vacuum the whole table in an area before I open up the resin. Otherwise, you just capture that dust in the resin. And while you're cutting the cloth, all these little chunks get in there, these little things. Oh, is really vacuuming up. I want to clean my hands up. I don't want to have any dust or dirt. Usually on your shirt when you're sanding, there's always a bunch of dust. I go outside and blow that out. Because any of this dust that winds up in a fiberglass, <laughs> you get all these little lumps and chunks. And once they're in there, by the time you sand them out, you've broken through the cloth, lost some of the strength. It's just easier to do a good cleanup before you start any of these glassing jobs fresh newspaper on a table. Again, just to make it a little bit easier to work. Sometimes it's the work environment that you have to work in. That if you have all these chunks and dust and things flying around, that no wonder the job doesn't come out as good as you want. This is also a good idea. When you're going to do this, you don't want to have the thing sliding around the table. So what I do is I tape down the newspaper with some wide tape. When that, what that allows me to do now, the newspaper 
when I'm working on it isn't going to be floating around. And on a big job like that, this can really make it easy for you. It's a, it's a great little tip. It doesn't have to be too fancy. In fact, in this case, we don't even have to worry about that. What we don't want is to be in the middle of this while you have gloves on and, and things floating and all of a sudden everything shifts. So this gives it a little stability. Since we're never going to, well, almost never going to do the wing tips, I can use this as a little cushion just to protect it so I don't get it dinged up. I like it near the end of the table. Now, if you have a helper, of course, even better. And I use some towels or some shirts or some anything just to hold this in position. This is just to temporarily hold it. Because again, when I get one side done, I'm going to want to flip it over. But on this side, it'll stand on these center mounts, and I'll just put towels under the tip to level it out. Same way I'm doing here, but smaller ones. So I have a couple of extra towels sitting here waiting, just in case I need them. Now what that gives me, it's nice and, well, I could put a little shim under here too. Something that would hold that up. See, so you got to invent this as you go along. That's the problem half of the time. Okay. Do I have all the materials I'm going to need, the razor blades ready, everything ready, lined up on a table. One important step, one of these, a brand new one. You need to do this, this kind of a job. Even one little rough edge on this. And you can sand them and clean them, but then they drag and they hook the, the little threads in the cloth. Get all this ready. This is half ounce cloth that I get from George Spar. I think Brodak even has this now, so it's it's not real critical, but there's there's orientation. The threads can go I want the threads in one direction going tip to tip. I don't want an X pattern. So what I need to do first is lay this out, take a whole pack, probably use one whole thing tip to tip here if we can. Actually, this is going to work out almost like I planned it this way. Now, we don't need anything on the trailing edge, that's for sure. It's, nothing's going to happen back by that trailing edge. But we do want to orient it this way. Now, from this point, I want to figure out exactly what shape I want to make that. And a good way to do that is with a brand new or a real sharp pair of scissors. Scissors that John Gunn had given me. I just want to see if they're gonna, if this is a brand new pair. I had a whole bunch of them, oh yeah. I always cut it a little bit oversize, and I'll trim the front. When I'm done, I have to trim around a bulkhead here anyway. Also, if you're trying to cut e-glass and get nice cuts, you can go on a stack of newspaper with a brand new blade. That'll work for you too. I also want to cut some strips so I can all go over the joints with strips. Everywhere there's a joint, I want to have a maybe a one inch or so band. Now there's a lot of ways to do this. One of the ways is you can paint the wood and then try to drop the cloth in and it gets all mushy and everything. But what I'm going to try to do, and it's worked in the past, is lay out the cloth exactly where I want it and then start applying the resin. And this is just going to take a little bit of time to get this cut exactly to the shape I'm going to be I'm going to be happy with. Now I've heard of another way that I haven't used is by just putting a very few drops of contact cement down just to hold it. Mm, I really don't care for that though. Now I need to trim and get all the edges cut exactly the way I want them up around the bulkhead. That'll that'll be kind of time. Get out of here. That'll be kind of time consuming. So I'll we'll leave that go for now. We won't bother putting that on camera, but then we want to start getting the resin mixed and get this at least one piece here. Once this is in position, then we'll put the reinforcements over the joints. Put a double layer here, a triple layer here. I'll cut all those pieces off camera. Try to get all my ellipses, all my parts cut up. The idea of the ellipses is each one should get a little small so they don't, you don't want them to all end at the same spot and then you get a step. Instead, you get and it's easier to bury it in the paint. You make it like a wedding cake. This is important. 
Chicky has to go in the cage. But notice that he's eyeballing up this the scraps that Eagle has. He loves to have some of them in there. Okay, I got our first piece laying in place, rough trimmed. Now what I want to do is mix up. Now I only mix up the resin one ounce at a time. Rest Systems resin. You have a pump. In fact, let me show that. Sometimes, you know, people say, oh, you didn't, didn't show it. Well, this is Rust Systems Resin 105, the hardener. There's a fast hardener and a slow hardener. We're going to use the slow hardener today because we, do, we basically just don't want to rush this operation. I want to take my time here. This is very important. Most important thing, I have the heat turned down in the house so it's cool. It's about 60 degrees, and this allows me a little bit of extra working time. And one way to, and we're gonna we're gonna try to use this method. One way is to just get very little of the resin, paint down the corners, herringbone them kind of. And this this makes the the cloth kind of get set in its initial position without a problem. And this is a very when it when it starts to cure, it gets very very sticky. So it's not like it's not going to go into the wood when you do it this way. I've, in the past, done a little test, made one that I did this way on a flap, and one where I wet the wood with the resin and everything, and they basically weighed the same. So actually, the resin is capillary enough that it goes right down through the cloth. But now that I've got that stuck down, now I can start and just randomly here. This just, just helps it stick down so I don't get big giant wrinkles everywhere. Once I get the first layer drawn out, the reason you never mix more than one ounce of resin at a time, first off, you cart it off. You'll, you leave, this will add about an eighth of an ounce. Each side will be an eighth of an ounce, this amount I've done plenty of times before. What you don't want to do is mix two ounces, three ounces of resin at once because it'll, it starts exotherming up on you. Okay, now we can just basically start in the middle like a sunburst and kind of paint this on wherever we want. Working our way out to the edges. And this just takes a little time. I'm trying to force it through. for the part that gets a little tricky is you start in the middle and work a sunburst. And you notice how much of that resin is coming off. Just make a giant sunburst. This is the first layer. Now we're going to try to get all three layers down here unless this resin starts kicking off. We've got the temperature way down so we probably have plenty of working time here. Notice it's like a sunburst. That's what gets you the most wrinkles out. And if you're in doubt, it's always a good idea just practice a little bit on a, you know, on a garbage can or something, or on a scrap, like a pretend wing or something. Get your technique down. This is why you need a brand new one of these every time, because even in one shot, it gets a little rough edges. They go right out over the wood, let it just have an uneven edge when it ends. And we'll get the rest of the little bit that's on the end cleaned up with alcohol at the end. Anywhere I see anything like a wrinkle, I'm just kind of pulling this to the front because I want the nacelles to sit down on this cloth. I don't want the nacelles attached to 16th balsa. I mean, that's not... I would expect Boeing doesn't do things like that. They figured it out ahead of time. And I've got some of the cloth going right back up here. And because we're near the end of this tape, we'll just this will probably be the last thing we get on here, but we'll get as many of the little steps as we can. Now I'll do the other side off camera, but it's the same thing. Sunburst. Keep carding up. And look how much resin is already off. Now remember, West Systems resin is a laminating resin. That means it's meant that actually it's this is one of the things it's designed for, is to they originally came up with this system to work on wood boats where they wanted to 
fiberglass them or something very similar to that. Now I'm just patting in all my ellipses one by one, staggering the edges. It doesn't matter which one goes on top or the bottom, as long as they have staggered edges. Now it's just sticky enough now, I'm about half into the pot life of this, that that's going to lay right down. It absorbs the resin. The stuff that you get from George Spar has a material, it has a chemical called VLON in it that makes it absorb the resin a lot better than non-VLON cloth. Now, the third one, you would see, doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure this out. We can get our long one in. Again, this is going out to roughly where the nacelles are going to be. And if it gets real dry, I can just trowel on a little extra resin. But now it means I've got three layers on here. And again, this tape might just run off the end of the tape, I'm not sure. But I figure we could get every second of, of this part on that we possibly can. Now, you can look at that real close and see that that's just picking up the resin from right underneath it with that V-Long. I can take the trowel, go back to trowel. All I want to see is, when I'm done, I don't want to see any wet resin. I want to see just cloth that I know I have it. Just that last, the last one is just dry. If you put on gallons of resin and just let it sit there, all you're making is a big sanding job for yourself later on. And obviously any time, and you, we get almost all the resin off. You leave almost none on. And when I've done this and waited on, like say, a pattern master or a cardinal wing, it's roughly a quarter of an ounce for the whole job. More than that, and I think it's just unnecessary or not enough, then that's after it's all sanded off, of course, because we're going to get even more off when we sand it. Now the last thing is, and I'll do all the strips, is get my strips that I already have pre-cut here. This is just insurance. I'll spend the last eight or ten minutes while before the resin goes off I'm on the clock right now. You really have about 20 minutes when it's cool like this. Get my center piece in. This one is just a little bit long. So now that right around the bell crank and at the center joint we have four layers of half ounce. So will just give us a little insurance for you know, we want this plane to have a long, and, and in, in, in our case, it's always a long, rough life at the fields we fly at, and the local contest here where the wind is always howling and turbulence and everything, so we always, we always tend to build toward long life rather than uh, one season wonders. And you never get to the Spitfire bedroom if you don't make it through that first season, so. And uh, uh, this, of course, would work no matter what foam wing you're doing. Oops, we picked up two there. Little one-inch strip over the joints. Now we're going to go and until the resin actually kicks, we'll just start troweling away. Now, if you were using SIG glue instead of West resin, you could apply a little heat. In this case, we don't really need it. We can even use the resin that's already here. The West Systems resin is real easy to work with. And the nice thing is tomorrow or the next day, this will be perfectly sandable in 24 hours. That's one of the advantages. Now, we may not have enough tape, but I want to flip this over as soon as we're done. Flip this on its back. Again, there's no reason to be intimidated by any of this. When you see a nice glass job, it weighs very little and it adds a lot of strength. Now we're pushing that resin right down through four layers of cloth. And anything comes to the surface. Now what I'll do, I don't know if we're going to still have enough tape, is I'm going to go around all the edges with some isopropyl alcohol. Any, get any little drips or runs. Anything that isn't nice and neat by the time I'm done. Any little hairs or little threads that are showing won't mean anything. Just sand right out. 
And as soon as the tissue goes on, buries it. I'm trying to show the pattern, you can see the texture that it's there's very little extra resin on this. Out here where the joints are, it's all doubled over. And these extra threads, tomorrow morning I'll sand off with one or two swipes of 320 sandpaper. Now the trick is, the last thing, and we made pretty good time, I kind of keep an eye on my little, there's all the resin I swished off. I keep an eye on it, because as soon as I see that kick off, then I know I have to really go to town here, because a big mass kicks off quicker than a small mass. So now the trick is I want to get my isopropyl alcohol and clean up all these edges. Get a clean pair of gloves on. Clean, wipe the edges. I don't want to get any in the middle. Because the alcohol, a lot of people take SIG glue, for instance, and dilute it with alcohol as a way to make it trowel out nicer. The problem is the direct relationship you add alcohol is what you lose strength in any epoxy. Any dilutant, you lose strength, even an epon. So we don't want to dilute anything near the middle here. I want this, and right here, it's it's double and triple layered where the nacelles are going to go. And out here, I've got two layers at the high spot. So I'm guessing that's going to be, you know, we're looking for long life here. I'd like to have this, actually, uh, uh, say something very, may, may sound like a little wacko or something. I want to have this plane until the day I die. And then pass it on to somebody that will truly appreciate the love I put into it. I want to just get isopropyl alcohol just damp, now not soaking wet. Just where the resin and cloth are ending, it'll just make my sanding just a tad easier. Get right up along the leading edge. Anything like a drip or a drool you can clean up. Anything that stays on there, I don't want to do the middle. That's my, I don't want to compromise. Here's a little spot here I could wipe down. Just get it down. I can feel the resin starting to go off already. And by the way, if, if you've mixed more than an ounce of resin at any given time, well, this is getting ready to go right now. It starts to smoke. You'll see, you see you can't turn it out. Now just watch, that's gonna catch fire in about one minute. <laughs> and it smokes and it, it'll make you crazy if you didn't expect it to happen. Any big mass of epoxy, when that goes. Now we just had good timing here. It's actually called a walk. Just the edges, but well, this will be a joy to sand out tomorrow. This, this doesn't have a single bad spot. <coughs> Very few bad spots. I never reuse the, the brushes. What I used to do is clean them in acetone. <laughs> the cost of the acetone is more than the brushes. The brushes are Home Depot, 29 cents each kind of brushes. It doesn't pay to even clean them. So we are one side down now. I don't know if we're going to run out of tape here. I can't look inside the camera. Yet. But we're at the end. We're going to flip this over. As soon as this is dry to the touch, and that should be less than 15 minutes. It'll be dry to the touch. Here's our resin, just so you can, boy, that's red hot. Oh, by the way, you can't even touch it. See, it's melting the cup. It's actually so hot. It's, see the smoke coming off of this? Let's see if you can see this on the screen. It's getting ready to catch fire. So what I usually do is I just dump this in a sink or something. There it goes. But if you didn't know this was happening, see the cup melting away? This, Or if you had this sitting by a can, an open can of gasoline or something, it might be a problem. Always be aware. More than an ounce, it really gets hot too. See the smoke coming off of this? There you go. Look at that smoke coming off of there. That's getting ready to kick. Now we know because this is drawn out, I still have about five minutes I could trowel or do my work over there, but no reason to. But that, that's why you want, you want the shop cool. It gives you a little extra work in time. The thing now that we're done is clean off the spatula. Again, these really get one little nick in them, and you got to dump them. For this kind of work anyway, where it's cosmetic, where you don't want to see a single little issue there. Okay, we're going to flip this over. I think we're at the end of the tape, though. i got to look inside. Flip it over, I have everything cut, and we're ready to do the other side. Very hardened out, so we can dump the brush. 
put new newspaper out, get the whole table reprepped for the other side. Now we're right at the end of this tape, and we're not going to have time to get the second thing on. But there is something funny that I've been looking at all these B-25 videos this week that Bruce Hunt sent, and there's a funny scene in one of them. I want to share that with you, and that's how we're going to end. Just think about it for a minute. It's, I thought it was pretty funny. Anyway, and then we'll see you on the next tape. you do, then the landing gear lever might accidentally be lifted, and a B-25 is not designed for digging tunnels. Someone's carelessness in securing the safety lock and latch in the plane made this ridiculous accident possible. Propellers cost money. You can't throw them away like matches. Another word of caution. Before running up your engines on the line, always look behind you to make sure that your prop blast won't endanger persons or property. Your next step is to check the propeller controls at about 2100 RPM. Move controls to full decrease and note decrease in RPM. Then shift. I thought you'd enjoy that thing about the landing gear. Can you imagine? Just, <laughs> oh, embarrassing moments in the life of a B-25. Anyway, thanks a lot for joining us. Enjoy every minute you're involved with model aviation, it's the best. And it wouldn't be appropriate to uh, not thank Big Jim Greenaway, who this glassing technique that we use with the ellipses and we've used over the last 25 years, I guess, 20 years, I don't know, it was his innovation, he deserved the credit for it, and it has worked flawlessly. And of course, there's a lot of ways to do things. We can only share with you the way that we know and the way that we've been shown from other people. Again, thanks for joining us. Hey, looking forward. This is starting to look like a B-25. Just don't pull up the gear while we're, uh, <laughs> while we're standing around here glassing away. I almost, I almost rolled over when I saw that the first time on the TV. I was doing something else. I was, can you imagine? Embarrassing moments. And how good is it knowing as a few errant snowflakes are falling outside, how good is it to know? All the clear is drying. You may even get Mike's plane painted next week. Just knowing that the longer that plane sits up by the heating vent now, it'll just be easier and easier when it's time comes to sand and buff. And we're going to try to get Ron's motor broken in this week, too. Can't wait to run that 100. And, Tom, Hampshire has our Weber 32, so we're going to try to connect with him, get that done in the next week. And boy, I have to be honest, I just can't think of anything else, anything, that I'd rather be doing than just spending my life the way I am. I am really one of the most fortunate people of all time. And to have the friends that I have, the family I have, and of course, peeps. I don't know, if I had to write this script, I don't know if I could have, could have even imagined to write it any better to be able to share it with people through a medium of video. What a wonderful thing. By the way, check this out. This is a picture of me in my college days with my pet. <laughs> I had a pet possum at the time. He used to go to school with me. Ah! Hard to believe. I just really don't know how it could be more fun. Anyway, thanks a lot. Thanks so much for joining us. And please pass these tapes around. Please get more people interested in the hobby so we can all share it and have these great Nats and Brodacks and VSCs and parties and who knows what else. Then we'll see you on the next tape. Well, we'll see you in a Spitfire bedroom. Thank you.